The men's basketball team plays at Penn State on Wednesday at 6 p.m. on BTN, then hosts Minnesota at 11 a.m. at the Kohl Center in a game televised by ESPN on Saturday. Not sure if I said that. Head coach Bo Ryan is here, and we'll take questions. Well, you guys have been really strong out of the gates the past three, four weeks in games. Um, I know every team tries to start strong. What's allowed you to do that? Is it do do credit experience, just guys being ready and knowing your message and, and being ready to go out there and execute? Yeah, I think you got to give credit to the players. They're, you know, you still you talk about games, you practice the sets of the other team, you run your stuff, you do your – uh, due diligence as a coaching staff, but it's still the players that make it happen. Uh, you know, not every game we've gotten off to a a good start, but there's there's a lot of teams that get it done in games where maybe things were a little bit of a grind early and then figured out a way later. So it's still the end result. But I think with the seniors that we have, the guys, the, the experience they gained last year, you got to give credit to them. You've obviously coached for a lot of years. You've coached a lot of teams. You've coached against a lot of teams. How good is this team, do you feel like? Well, this team will make its statement by its uh, production for the whole season. You know, not any speculation during, before, uh, three quarters into it. Uh, teams are still judged by um, their overall accomplishments. Uh, but they're a good team. They're a great bunch of young men that are playing hard together. Um, but there's been a lot of teams that I've watched over the decades have really good teams. And then come tournament time, one bad game, one, and then people dismiss uh, their work. And I've always been anti that, which you guys know here. I still think it's uh, the process of our game with uh, the way the tournament is set up is you really have to be fortunate for at least six games. So when the season's over, people have their opinions of this team, but I sure enjoy working with them. Jeff. Bo, you, you mentioned the seniors, you know, tying it into the quick starts, but you got two sophomores in the lineup too, and Bronson and Nigel. Are they as playing as seasoned and with as much poise early as, as your seniors are that it's contributing to that as well? Yeah, uh, they definitely are, and I think there's there's reasons. There, there are definite reasons. The fact that we got uh, the legislation passed to where we could work with the players in the offseason for a couple hours, not like we're driving them into the ground, and in the summer for a couple hours. Uh, we could do things with the drills to, to give them an idea so that when they're playing their pickup games in the summer, they're actually running our offense and actually defensively trying to do the things by word of mouth through the upperclassmen. So, um, you know, now Bill Raftery brought it up, and, and he knows how I've coached for a long time, is you do get your players to understand they can coach themselves. Um, and what he meant by that, and he because he, he knows how I operate, um, you know, there's always a chance for people with experience on a team to – get messages across. I always mention the voice in the locker room, but it's also the voice out on the pickup games for basketball is really key. You know, you can't always do it in other sports, have pickup games like, like our sport. Um, so if you're, if you're experienced players, the ones that have had a chance to be in the program, aren't really getting anything until October 15th, like it used to be, then uh, it makes it harder. But uh, Bronson and Nigel, without a doubt, are playing uh, like, like juniors, for sure. And I think by saying they're a year ahead, it's basically because of the legislation and the fact that uh, they're here together in the summers, taking classes so that they can graduate in four years uh, and maybe even start a master's program. Well, this isn't, certainly isn't the first team of yours to have good chemistry, but 
it's very noticeable, I guess, to those of us on the outside. How noticeable is it to you, and how important is that to you, um, just that they all get along and seem to like one another? Well, that's fine. I've seen some teams that, where the players really liked each other and they weren't very good, or they were struggling. Not to say they weren't very good. They weren't having a great year. Um, but as coaches, we don't really look for that hug thing uh, about the, the team. It, it's because sometimes when you're stirring the pot a little bit and there's a couple guys on the team that are pushing the envelope, uh, it makes for some good practices. And uh, like, you know, we had two days off and those two practices afterwards, we were a little chippy with one another. But not once they got to the locker room or anything else. But, you know, there were some bodies banging and some things going on and guys uh, expressing themselves a little bit under their breath. And uh, I thought that helped get us prepared for Illinois. Um, so, but, I, you know, it's if they respect one another, that's the key. Not sure how much time you're able to devote to watching the entire landscape of college basketball, but is Frank as deserving as anybody else for National Player of the Year consideration at this point of the year? Well, you know, it's amazing when you're watching a game and you hear them talk about, oh, the Big Ten, it's, look at this, Wisconsin, they have one loss. And look to who they lost to. They lost to the team in the bottom of the league. And it, and I'm listening. Did they say that Frank didn't play? No. That's okay. Did they say that Trey went down with a broken foot? Nope. That's okay. Because it's good for the league. Because, you know, if, you, if the first team can lose to the last team and, you know, there's upsets like that, then that's better for viewership, I would think. Um, I can't remember where I heard that, though, whether it was BTN or not. Uh, but... What's that have to do with your question? Do you want to play with Frank, or would you rather have Frank sitting out? I'd rather have Frank playing, and he's as good as any player in the country right now for what he means to his team, and he's backing it up with his performances. He's pretty steady. It's not like he has 40 and then five. He's been pretty steady. So yeah, I think he is one of the top players in the country that I've ever coached for sure and that exists right now in college. Andy? But when was the last time with this particular group that you thought, boy, they've, they're not tethered to where I want them to be as a, as a team, that you had to kind of reel them back in and put them perhaps in their place? Was there a moment recently, maybe a year ago? When was the last time? I don't know. I thought um, – I didn't know what direction that they would go after the Duke game because I had to go back and look at that. Duke played very well. Defensively, looking at that game, I went back again and looked at the game four years ago when we beat them. By far, this Duke – how come I always end up talking about Duke when I'm talking to you? This Duke team that we played is better. So what I wanted to make sure was they didn't think that they weren't good enough. But I didn't have to reel them in. That's so just had to keep reminding them. You know, we we got something here. You guys keep working together. We're okay. We we can be all right. Um, but I don't think there was a moment of an explosion or a uh, one of those things that they talk about ten years from now. I can't think of any any anything like that. The reason I ask just that this team is seems to have its eye on the prize, so to speak, that there was there a moment where you thought maybe those that vision had drifted into stuff that maybe didn't matter, awards, um, oh, I attention, that type about of themselves? thing? Yeah, that's a good question. No, I have not seen that. And I think, Frank, all, how he's handled all the attention that he's received, I think that's the key. Bo, yesterday, John Gross was talking about Nigel's assist-to-turnover ratio, it, calling him like a power forward and how he can handle the ball. And that, When you guys were recruiting him, was that part of his game that you noticed, whether it was 
ball handling, vision, passing ability, things like that. Well, you know, Nigel, first of all, when you look at him physically, you're going to say, we need to get him. Okay, so did we say, first of all, we need to get Nigel Hayes because he's a really good passer? Uh, that became part of it. But his personality, his, his wit, his uh, extremely bright young man, and just the more you're around him, it's like he's got to be in our program. We, get, we have to have him at Wisconsin. And this is before a lot of the other – and then uh, when push came to shove, he said, hey, Wisconsin's been there from the beginning. Um, Coach Paris did a heck of a job. The parents liked this, and he became a Badger, even though he received some pressure from other places. Um, but you say a power forward. He's like a point forward. Point forward meaning, a, a, yeah. Um, Nelly, when he called, uh, help me out here, the forward, point forward. Moncrief or uh, – Pierce, or I'm not sure, but he's a he's a point forward. Paul Pressy, maybe, yeah. Wait, aren't you a hockey guy? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it was Pressy. Yeah. Uh, after uh, Penn State's loss, I believe it was yesterday, uh, Coach Chambers had some words about the officials and the calls and feeling that certain coaches, certain programs might not be getting the benefit of calls while other coaches and other programs were getting those. I wondered if you thought when you, especially when you first stood out here with the Badger program, whether you thought that existed against in your favor and you might be on the other side of that now as a coach. I think everybody works hard that wears a striped shirt. This is a hard game to officiate. Jim? I don't know how you follow that. Um, going back to your answer to Andy about Frank and, and how he's handled the notoriety, what specifically have you seen about the way he's, he's reacted to all this headlines and, and talk. Yeah, it just shows how grounded he is. And I, I, you guys have heard me say this a hundred times. I go back to your parents are your first teachers and, you know, he obviously got some pretty good advice as he was being raised. And um, I think the input there uh, started uh, the process of how he took in what he was told and how he dealt with constructive criticism. People, you know, basketball players, because we have T-shirts and shorts on, when we go into other gyms as players, some of the things they say you can hear. And you can actually see the person. There's no helmet. There's nothing to protect. Um, so you learn to get thick skin in a hurry as a basketball player if you're in the upper echelon and somebody who the other team targets to be like the guy you got to take care of. So... Frank, is, uh, Frank has handled all that at an early age, uh, which has helped him to deal with it the way he does here. Um, and he really, he really likes his teammates. He likes his, his classmates. He, he likes the campus. He's – what a joy to know that there are people like that out there in, in this athletic world. Sticking on that same theme, you would think that you would want someone to fill that role every year. Who do you see capable or who plays that role next when, when Frank's gone? Well, that's not to diminish what Josh Gosser and Trey and the other guys leadership-wise have, but we were referring to his getting notoriety as to how he handled it and how the team uh, did around him. Um, I think that'll be an interesting process during the off season. That's where you usually find out in the off season and then in the summer. Um, but they've had some good, uh, some good mentors along the way uh, for anybody who does move into that role next year. At least they've had some 
good examples. Okay. Hey, Bo. I'm really going to delve into the uh, in-depth part of the program here. Uh, do you sit in the back of the plane when you fly to Penn State? Always. Why is that? I try to sit in the back of every plane because I've never seen a plane back into a mountain. <laughs> and I hate to say that because the wind sometimes around Happy Valley, around the, the airport, whew. But you know, the more I think about it, I always sit in the front of the bus, and if a bus stops in a hurry, you, the person sitting in the front has no chance. <laughs> but it's just something I've always done. Are you superstitious? Eh, maybe a little bit. They would, you know what the guys would do at Platteville because we drove to La Crosse, Stevens Point, Eau Claire, Superior? They would, they would bet on how long it would take for me to nod off on the bus. Some picked Fenimore, uh, others picked La Crosse on the four-hour trips. Um, but yeah, I, I never figured out why you don't have a seat belt at least in the front seat of a bus. Actually, a new bus that we were on did have one. Did anybody else notice that? Anybody been on a new bus? They actually do have seat belts. What about uh, changing hotels? If you go someplace and lose, uh, what do you think we're going to give them our business again? <laughs> that's a good that's, point. That's not right. But for some reason, I think we ended up in Nebraska at the same hotel as the year before. I don't know if it was because it was the only one available at, during that date or what. But yeah, if they want our business, they have to be kinder to us in the gym. Only seems right. Who's giving you all this information? I got I got to find out who the leak is in the program. <laughs> oh, former player. Okay. I got you, you. you did put the seatbelt on. Is that what you're saying? But it was only to go to the airport. So I no, I didn't, because it just didn't seem right. Uh, we didn't get up to speeds. It, you know, it went from the coal center to the airport, and the most was 35, 35 miles an hour. So I figured I could survive that one. Uh, I lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, how do you feel like uh, Sam has developed over the last few years uh, up until now, and, and how, has your, how has your relationship with him evolved over the last three years coaching him? Well, I, uh, I treat each player pretty much the same as far as um, you know, what you're, what you're willing to uh, accept from them and um, how they react to constructive criticism and praise. And, you know, Sam's, Sam realized he had weaknesses. Um, and he's been trying hard to work to overcome those. Um, there's a couple clips that I have today that I'll show them at 4 o'clock. Sam might even faint. Uh, but I actually have him playing some good defense, and I, point, and I pointed it out on the teaching clips. So I don't know how Sam will be at practice today. He might come out to practice. Whoa, Coach Ryan said something good about me on, on the defensive end. Um, or, hey, I blocked out this time. Uh, no, he's trying. He's like everybody else. He's trying like everybody else. And uh, his offensive skills – were at a level when he came in, and some other skills were maybe not quite as high. So what happens in life if you have a skill that's really high? Let's say somebody has hair that's, they, that is used in shampoo commercials. It's so thick. And let, well, then what people tend to think is that the rest of the person's got to be pretty good then. But they might have you know, a little uh, rough skin or something like that, and then it doesn't go together. So, so Sam had, the, you know, had the good hair, but some other things needed to be uh, taken care of, worked on. I don't know. That's probably a bad analogy. Well, Jeff, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> I know. He's always doing something with the – I should show him pictures of Elroy Hirsch with that uh, crew cut that he had, the buzz.
you said that he would, you, you indicated that he would kind of be surprised that you would show something good. Uh, oh, I've shown you, something you, good about him. But, you know, the, you know, the other end might outweigh it, though. Does, uh, has that been a process with, with you guys? You know, you, you mentioned that constructive criticism and things like that. Has that been a process over the last three years for, 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 uh, for him to accept that and for, you know, to try to figure out kind of a balance of how to give it and how to accept it? Well, he seems to be listening, but, you know, transmit has always been on. Receiving is up to the student. But, you know, students can't learn if the teachers can't teach. So it's my responsibility to try to get him to be better in his overall game, just like it is with everybody else. And I've never particularly cared if they liked it or not. That's... I'd have been out of coaching a long time ago if that was if that was what it was all about. It's um you know, I was coached too also. Some things when a coach says them has a certain barb to it and you get over it and it's like, yeah, he's right. You know, it's, in the long run, he's not he didn't tell me my coaches didn't tell me anything that wasn't something that was a uh, true. They didn't make up stuff to make me feel bad. <laughs> so I, I accepted it. And again, it started with my parents. Because believe it or not, I wasn't like the best kid around the house. And the, I was always taken off. Looking for something to do. A hill to climb, another hill to climb. I, I told Mike Lucas he's the one that got me that nomination from the, from the sales of the, of the book. He's probably still laughing. <laughs> <You got practice. laughs> or no, wait a minute, it's 10 after because Duye had a class, so we moved, we moved the uh, start time of our clips to 410. And what is it now, 4 o'clock? 55. So, by the way, we did set a record today. Um, I was notified by the Big Ten office that my 12 minutes that I had today was the shortest time period for any coach to have been asked any questions. <clears throat> the, the, Big Ten, the Big Ten sent me that memo. I heard that too. So I'm I, I'm second again, Jeez. because the the guy who does them had to ask me one about Frank. The only other question was, oh, about injuries, yeah, with teams. Bo, Andy. Bo, your choice between if you had to sit on a plane next to one. Uh, color commentator, would it be Dan Dockich or would it be Bill Walton, and why? I would, I don't sit in the middle seat. I'd sit in the middle seat between those two guys and listen to them. I mean, Dan is very sure of himself, uh, coaches the game as it goes along, and that's what they're looking for with a lot of these, the, how competitive that market has become, Andy, with the Big Ten Network, SEC, ACC, Everybody's pushing their leg. They get their pep talks behind closed doors of, and like talk about coaching a little bit. Talk about what you might have done here, or that's that's encouraged now way more than before. Um, and Bill Walton will talk about the Walrus, and but he'll also say some things that he said to our players at that practice where he's spot on about his respect for his coach, how things were done when he played and that he might have bucked the system a little bit at first, but when he realized that Coach Wooden had his best interests at heart, Bill Walton was hooked on doing what he was supposed to do. Um, you know, and Dan's coached. Dan played. He played for Bobby, uh, Coach Knight. And, 
you can imagine the experiences that he's had. He remembers the days of if you didn't play well, you fly back to Bloomington, go in there and put your practice stuff on and go more hours. That's illegal now by the NCAA. Uh, so you talk about two different guys. Yeah, I'd like to be in the middle of those two, if that's a fair answer. He's, he's a guy that you would go to the corner establishment with and have the greatest five or six hours you could ever think of. His stories, his, his demeanor, his perception of things, he, he's, to me, he's one of the guys like, you know, neighborhood guy. And I played against him. So he can continue to tell the story of he came to Wilkes with his team. The gym is packed. You can't get another body in the gym. Of course, the wrestling mat's down, and Wilkes was a powerhouse in wrestling. It's packed. Well, the wrestling match was over, and so we go up to the locker room, get changed. We come out. There were 112, the reason I know we counted them. There were 112 people that stayed for the basketball game my freshman year. And I looked at my buddy from Chester that went with me, and we looked at each other. After playing at Chester High, where there was never an empty seat at the, on the road or at home, and we're playing in college in front of 112 people at home, and it was his team we were playing against, Raftery's team. So he always gets that needle in. Whatever he said, I can't remember. We were not very good. We, uh, my, my teammate and I from high school started as freshmen, so what does that tell you? Because if we went to, Tem I was, if it was Temple or Rutgers, wherever I was going to go, you couldn't play as freshmen then. But at a small college, you could. Little sideline. Anything else for Coach? All right, thanks. Thank you.